give us some questions. Have this in mind as I make my presentation. Why do we see things from certain perspectives? Why do I, why do I have certain beliefs or believe in certain stereotypes? What makes us part of a group? And why do we feel our ways of life are superior or inferior to others? And the main question I would like all of us to ask is, what do I know? And how does my knowledge um, work in deciphering the information that I receive? Mind the gap is a regular catchphrase in the London Underground stations. And it is a way of cautioning commuters that there is a gap between the platform and the train, the train. And it is on this caution that I want us to be wary of the danger of standing still and to throw caution to the wind when it comes to issues of learning. Um, we travel in different ways, but Mostly, we travel through the mind, in our thoughts, in our heads, in, in the information we receive every day through the use of our imagination. Um, when we receive information, even as a child, it has a lot to do with our environment, what we know, what we learn, what we hear, what we see. And traveling, which is my topic of the day, for me, has a lot to do with learning. I see myself as a nomad. I'm a photographer, and I'm a nomad because I do not stand still. I love to travel, I love to document, I love to tell stories. And so traveling for me is through the physical realm, through space and time, you know? And growing up as a child, I lived all across the country and in other places around the world. Because my father loved to travel, and my mother, due to her job, was always deployed to different cities across Nigeria, from Enugu, Ibadan, Benin, Sokoto, Bauchi, Kaduna. I can go on and on, different cities. Most times, in every other year, we're in a different city. And I was lucky enough to have a father who loved to, to take his children with him. I realized one day that I was a very curious child. I wanted to understand how things work at all times. I saw a picture on a wall, and it was a black and white image. I was probably six or seven at the time. And the contrast between the black and white was so beautiful, and the story was amazing, because it could I, I could see like this was reality, and it, it got me asking, how did this picture come from real life and is stuck on a wall? I wanted to understand this. I, I, I kept bugging my dad. It was at a family friend's house. I was like, how did they make this? It's not a drawing. I was used to drawing. I, yes, I saw images here and there. We were used to the Polaroid system at the time, and pictures happened, but I wanted to understand how it happened. And he said to me, well, it's a Sumi smart call. I asked him, oh, what? <laughs> what does that mean? And he says, well, Sumi Smart Cole is a photographer, there he is right there, who documents stories and creates art with photos. So that black and white picture you saw is art. It's not just about the story, it's not just about the people, but the way he captured the light and the dark. And that really got me thinking, and that was my first proper introduction to photography. I bugged my dad <laughs> the whole day. I needed to understand this. Really explain to me, so what do I need to do? How do I get the picture on a paper? Do I draw it and imagine it and it becomes reality? What, what? And he tried as much as he could, but what he did for me was, on my birthday, he gave me a camera, rolls of film, and explained to me how to use it. And the rest was history. I took pictures of everything. <laughs> Cracks on the wall, you know, my dirty feet. And I would always ask what that meant to me. I started seeing the world in little boxes and no more as just a hole. And 
you, luckily enough, just a couple of, this, this picture was a couple of months ago. I met Sumi Smart Cole again. I hadn't seen him in many, many years. And I had to thank him for making me who I am today because of his story. So, like I said, I was very curious as a, as a child. I always wanted to understand how, understand how things worked. I remember my brother and I destroying my aunt's waterbed. <laughs> we took a knife to it and tore it apart because I wanted to understand how the water was stuck in her bed. We kept that secret for 25 years. <laughs> she only just found out a couple of years ago. And through the foam and the gauze and the, the layers of, of, of rubber, we flooded the whole house. But I learned a lesson that I could have found easier ways around understanding that by either asking questions or looking for just where they pumped the water in. So moving forward, I watched a movie called Sarafina. A couple of years after it, it, it had come out, I was probably 16, 17, and it was a story about the Soweto riots in South Africa. It touched me, and that had me thinking about how I could tell our own stories, because I had experienced riots in Sokoto when a certain emir was deposed. And I wanted to also tell those stories, but of course I was scared to <laughs> go out to document. I was young. I, I did have my camera, but it didn't make any sense at the time. Moving forward, I started to tell myself I love to absorb information, and I told people randomly as much as I could. Like, I would say random things like, do you know that yogurt you're drinking has bacteria in it? <laughs> or, a snort is what an antelope makes. I just absorbed random information and I always wanted to share. So Sarafina changed my mind about how we can tell our own stories and I was too young to understand what that meant to me. I always say that the antidote for, for ignorance is learning and interaction. So which brings me back to my, my idea of travel. I'm a strong supporter of the National Youth Service Corps because it takes people out of their comfort zone and forces them to places that they probably never would go to in Nigeria. The youth find themselves having to create solutions, whether they liked it or not, because the scheme is not perfect and it's not implemented properly. But you have to start to think about yourself. That's for those who are committed to actually serving the country for the one year that they are. And I went back to Enugu to serve my country in 2001. I found out so much about the Igbo culture, which reminded me that I had Igbo blood running in my veins. I come from a mixed religious, mixed tribe, <laughs> mixed race background, all of it. I have it in my family. So we had Christians and Muslims. I have Idoma, Yoruba, Igbo cousins, you know, cousins from different countries around the world. And I didn't realize how important that was for me until I started traveling around Nigeria. People looked at me with a certain stereotype, not because they wanted to, but because that's all they knew. And it didn't matter who I said I was or where I'm from. I'm dressed a certain way. Your name is Aisha. That's it. You're a northerner, you're a Muslim, you're a Hausa. And it was fine, I'm always very proud of that. I, use, I get some really annoying questions from time to time, like, wow, you went to school? <laughs> or, how come you're allowed to work? Your father or your husband lets you out of the house? Or, the worst one of all, you don't sound Hausa, you sound intelligent. <laughs> I get that one so many times, and it always hits me. But I realized, instead of trying to force who I am, or the person I am to the people, it's best to just show them. And in showing them, they, it opens up their minds to who a northerner is, or to who a house a person is, because I've broken the idea of the stereotype to them. You know, and we have all of these kind of stereotypes. It doesn't matter where you are. We, we believe certain things about certain people based on the information we have. And we sometimes 
interact or overact based on things that they do, thinking that we know better because of our information. Some people believe that certain cultures doing certain things, they must be crazy, right? I'm sure if you see someone half-dressed, running around, cutting knives, using a knife in his chest, uh, uh, trying to entertain, he, he's probably crazy, right? But that's part of his culture. That's his way of showing the world that I'm strong and I can handle anything that comes to me. So I also started to see things in a different light. How do I view other people, other tribes, other countries? How do I see them based on the information that I have? So I decided I'm learning through travel, as always. This quote says, though we travel the world over to find the beautiful, we must carry it with us or we find it not. And I say the same for those in Nigeria. We don't travel around Nigeria enough. We do not interact with each other enough. And that is why we get to have so many conflicts between each other, because we don't understand ourselves. And sometimes, just because the other generations have told you certain things about people, you come with a defense mechanism automatically. So the little that they do sparks up something. And that's why we have conflicts and fights all over the place. We have no empathy from, for certain tribes because we feel ours is better. But we're all Nigerians, we're all human. So traveling around the world, I visited Kenya, Tanzania, and I couldn't believe the world-class beaches and resorts they had. I found out that Tanzania had a population that was 99% Muslim, and they thrived based on tourism. No conflict. I also visited Korea, <laughs> and I kept asking them, when do, I, when do we actually get to South Korea? Because <laughs> the Korea I knew was the one I watched in the traditional films with the palaces and the knives and the samurai-looking people. But the Korea I found was more developed than most of the countries I had visited. And I was able to, to, to study the country as a case study on agriculture, how to build ourselves from nothing. Because Korea was nothing after the war. And they built everything they had with their own hands. And today, they provide us with most, a lot, a lot of the equipment we find around because they focused on exports. They used their people to build their own villages. And it wasn't about whether you were from here or there. How do we get ourselves up to meet the world. And moving forward, I also learned about the Fulani culture. Why? Because most people look at me and think I'm Fulani. They always, I have people who just come up to me and start speaking full, full day, or people who just ask, you must be Fulani, but I'm not. So that got me interested to know more about the people. And in the last 10 years, I have been documenting Fulani herdsmen, the Fulani nomads, the, the more developed ones, and the, mo the, the, the more modernized versions. This is a Fulani home. And this is the typical Fulani room. This is actually right here in Abuja, in Meitama. And these, these, you can see it's made out of cement, but you have the temporary structures, because they travel, they're nomads. And in all their travels around Nigeria, around Africa, they still stick to this, wherever they are. Why? Not because they don't see development, not because they don't see our cars and our phones and our laptops, but because they're loyal to their culture and their tradition. And we have no right to tell them that ours is better, or they need to drop all of this to stick to us. There's a science to this. They designed these homes thinking about their next move. The nomad wants to pick up and move when the grazing season begins. And when he needs to pack up, he doesn't need cupboards and beds and, and things that would keep them behind. They don't need material stuff that would slow them down. They want to be able to stand, pick up their spoons, and their plates and their cups that are hanging on their ceiling. They want to be able to, th these are like Milo 
hot chocolate containers. And they're able to just pick up and move, put the things on their horses or their camels, and move to the next city. And I realized, meeting a lot of them, that they spoke sometimes eight to ten languages. I went to a Fulani festival, and we had Fulani coming from Burkina Faso, Niger, Cameroon, and to Nigeria, because it's one of their pathways during the grazing season. And to them, they pick up the different languages. But because we don't know them, you're automatically thinking there's something wrong with these people. And the news doesn't help because we're told about the herdsmen and the fights and the clashes. But because we don't empathize with who they are, they are nomads and the number one thing to them in the world is their cattle. Anything that comes against that is, is danger. And on the, other, on the other hand, we have the farmers. Everything for that farmer is what he's going to, to reap from his farm. And a full animal coming to pass through his farm is danger. But if both sides understand each other, they can empathize. So in places like um, cities like, let's say, in Benue, um, Kebi, Sokoto, you have farmers that are willing to give the, 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 their harvest. After they've taken out the harvest, they give the stalks to the, to the, to the um, Fulani so that they can feed their animals instead of roaming through their farms. There's a, there's a, there's a way to it. There's a, there's a thing that complements each other. They interact. And the Fulani man gives his dung, which he piles up as he moves along, to the farmer. So there are ways that we can, we can interact with each other just based on knowing how we are. So this, like I said, is a very beautiful culture. I'm in love with them. <laughs> so now, two years ago, if I was told I would be in government, I would say no. I had times that I sit down and ask myself, where do I want to see myself in the next five years? Government was not one of them. I said, no, creative people don't have a place in government. Maybe as a consultant, but not as an official. But because of my photography and travel, I found myself taking the leap to tell the story of my people in Kebi State and to also be able to get information to the government on what they need to implement. We're seeing changes because there's an interaction now between the people and the government using social media. Same goes to me going out of my way to ensure that certain people make it to see the governor. Because one way or the other, we have to find ways to interact. And like I said, we have to learn about each other and understand how we work. So moving forward in Kebi now, I try to tell our stories, our needs, and what we need. And it's all based on where I travel and how I move along the way. So you reap what you sow. And I have three children, three beautiful boys, and I want them to wake up believing that there is love in anybody you meet. We can't see each other as enemies at any time. We should be able to empathize and understand why people do the things they do, why they have certain stereotypes, why they are who they are, self-reflection. I've seen the vanity in all of us through photography, and I will continue to explore and learn. And I hope that you do the same. Thank you.